Well, it's Wednesday, hump day, right? And we're looking forward to the rest of the week and what God has for us. And I'm particularly excited about the opportunity that I have with you this morning to just talk to you about Jesus. And I'm looking forward to that time. And hopefully the Lord will use this in your life and in our lives to encourage us and strengthen us along the way. So we've been asking questions. You know, Wednesday I come to chapel and I've got a bunch of questions. And so today the question is simply this, or as we've been looking at the questions, what is better, a gospel that grows or a tradition that brings death? We looked at that in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. And then we also looked at what do you need most? And of course we tried to sort that out. We need to know God in his word so we can walk in a way that will ultimately please him and glorify him. So the question for today is this, who is first? Who is first? All right, now, this is a little bit of a confession time, okay? Who is first? How many of you are totally obsessed with being first in line? Just raise your hand. Okay, uh, you know, that's good. You're ready to just confess. We have, we have counselors in the back that'll take care of you. But isn't that true? I mean, we're just obsessed about being first. I mean, that has undoubtedly crossed us or has characterized us at, at some point along the way. Or how about this? How many of you are just obsessed or in love with being the first to finish anything? You know, you just want to be the first one done. You know, like that, you, know, you just want to be the first one done with dinner, the first one done with the project, the first one, whatever, to get dressed. You know, life is a competition. And uh, you got to race to put your shoes on, race to get dressed, race to, to get to, to the next event and be the first one there. Or how many of you are like this? I have a family member this way. And I won't identify him for his own benefit, but how about this? When driving, how many of you are obsessed with not being passed on the highway? <laughs> okay, there are more of you than I thought, okay? Just hate being passed. I mean, my brother-in-law, oh, sorry. He would, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's still true of him, but when he would come to visit us from afar, they would uh, just love the thought of, not being passed all the way from Indiana to Virginia or wherever we were at the moment. Or how about when you're flying? Here's another one that I see a lot. How about when you're flying, you're traveling, you go to the airport? How many of you are obsessed with positioning yourself so you're like first in line or you're first to board? I'm like that. I mean, I start doing the pre-board moves. You know, like you're just checking everything out. And then you're, you're ready to just like get in position so when your name is called or your number is called or your boarding group is called, you're ready to go. And you don't want to get on the plane last and then find out you don't have any place for your carry-on or you're going to sit in the middle seat or something of that sort. You know, those are all things we try to avoid. Well, what I want you to see from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, that the answer to this question, who is first, is simply this. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest eternal person in both creation and redemption. Who is first? Jesus is. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest eternal person in both creation and redemption. And so my goal today is pretty straightforward. I just want to build your faith. I really do. I, I, as we go through this text this morning, I really want to see God use this text of Scripture and me as his messenger to help build your faith and your confidence in Jesus by just walking through the affirmations of Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And if I could just say it very simply, I just want to talk to you about the greatness of Jesus. That's all I want to talk to you about today. I just want to tell you how great the Lord Jesus Christ is. And then I want you to try to grab it and to enjoy it and to just think about it for the rest of the day. You see, my fear is this, that this will be another blah, blah, blah sermon presentation. A lot of facts about Jesus. And I don't want that to happen. I pray that it won't happen. I pray that the Lord would just visit us in this chapel this morning as he opens our eyes to this text and allows us to see the greatness of Jesus. It's kind of like, you know, those take a bite of something, chew it, and swallow it. It's like beef jerky. You know, you take a bite, you chew on it, 
and then you ultimately swallow it, and then you go back for some more. Well, that's kind of what this text is like. We want to take a bite of it. We want to chew on it. We want to enjoy it. We want to savor it. And then we want to just let it dominate us and become such a part of who we are. So my prayer is that this text will dominate us and that the Lord would indeed visit us with the light that we need to understand it and embrace it. You know, so if you get bored with me or you get bored with it in the few minutes that we have here this morning, why don't you just start praying? Lord, would you just bless the student body of Clearwater Christian College that you will visit us with the light of your Spirit's work in our heart to understand this text in a fresh way and let it dominate us this morning. So let's read the text this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, and I'm reading from the New American Standard this morning. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Call things, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. When you look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, it very simply is a song. It's a hymn. And we have really melodic affirmations of Jesus Christ. Two stanzas to this song. Two stanzas to this hymn. Verses 15 to 17 relate Christ to creation. And then verses 18 to 20 relate Christ to redemption. And what these two stanzas do is just simply celebrate the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, the greatest eternal person over creation. He is the Lord, the greatest eternal person of the new creation. The two stanzas, you take them together, 15 and 17, 18 to 20. The two stanzas declare that every area of life touched by sin is now touched by the grace of redemption and reconciliation. So how does this song, how does this hymn work in the chapter? Well, if you think about it, the false teachers that we talked about in Colossians chapter 1, the false teachers of the day wanted to sell the readers a worldview. They wanted to sell the readers in Colossae a worldview that promised knowledge, that included traditions and practices, but it did not feature Jesus Christ. It was a worldview that promised you a lot, but left you empty. It was a worldview without Christ. The hymn of 15, 1 to 20 sings simply this. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. And we will often be challenged and tempted with worldviews that offer us a lot, but leave us empty, leave us without Christ. And we want to be aware of that. We want to be discerning to that. The hymn is about Christ. It's all about Christ because of who he is and what he had done. This is, life is all about him. Life is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. You see, when you think about this hymn, as you look at because of who he is and what he's done, you look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, the hymn celebrates the fact that because of who Jesus is and because of what he has done, you go all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, you see, well, that's why the gospel bears fruit, because of Jesus and who he is in his glory and his personhood and his eternality. And then you look at verses 10 to 14 and and we can know him and please him because of who he is and what he's done for us. He is the eternal God who wants to have a relationship with us. And he's made the way so that that could possibly and, and forever take place. When you look at this hymn, 
it really hits our pride hard. Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20, hits our pride hard. You know, we think life is all about us. We want to be first. We want to be first in line, first to be done, first to get on board, first to be recognized, first to accomplish this, first to do that, first, first. We want to win. We want to win. And we really, and then in that passion, in that pursuit, what happens is we lose sight of what's really important, or should I say it this way, who's really important? Life is all about Jesus Christ. And that's why you come to a Christian college, because you hear that repeatedly throughout your classes and your interactions in student life and in chapels like this. So if you look at chapter 1, verse 15, we see that Jesus Christ is God, the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of creation. What in the world does this mean? The firstborn of creation. He's the image of the invisible God. Well, according to the text, as you see it there in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he is indeed the one who's made visible the invisible God. Now, let's ask us a couple of questions here. Does this statement then mean, when we say that he is the image of the invisible God and that he is the firstborn of creation, does these do these statements mean that Jesus is something less than God? You know, we could perhaps read that statement with that in mind. Is he some lesser person who just symbolizes God? He's not the real deal. He just symbolizes God. He's really not God. Or is he some lesser engraved image, like the image on a coin? Is that who he is? Is that what he's like? Is that what's being said to us here? Or is he some like murky image of a greater image? You know, you're trying to sort your way through the fog and you're looking to see that person who's behind the fog and you're looking through the murkiness. And is that what we're trying to do? Is that what we're trying to see? Is that what's being affirmed here? Not at all. No, no, and no. Jesus is not an imperfect image of a greater God. So then does this st statement mean that Jesus is a revelation of the Father and thus equals God. Yes. You see, Jesus is the eternal Son of God who is the visible expression of God to us. Now just, again, take a bite and chew on this with me. As God, he manifests to us the triune God. In other words, Jesus, God the Son, made the invisible God visible for us. Think about a couple of passages of Scripture that affirm this. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible. So here's a, an affirmation of the eternal God. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 1.3, and he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, and the exact representation of his nature. Does that sound like he's some murky image or some lesser presentation of Jesus or, or of God? How about John 1.18? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he explained him. Jesus explains the triune God to us. He is the invisible God who has made visible God to us. Jesus took on flesh and blood and bore the image of the earthly Adam and the image of the heavenly God. He's fully God, fully man. So you, I wonder, does this statement cause us problems? You know, Exodus 20 reminds us that we should not have any images that we worship. Is Jesus some sort of idol that we worship in place of God? No, no, not at all. He is the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Now, maybe we could ask another question. Since we're created in the image of God, does that make us God just like Jesus? Absolutely not. We are not the exact representation of his nature. We are created, yes, we are created in the image of God so we can enjoy a relationship with him. We represent God, but we don't fully manifest him. So what does this statement do for us? Here's a sila moment. 
What does it do for us? Now, here's what I want you to chew. Take a bite and chew. Chew on this with me just for a moment. Don't give up. Just think it through. I hope this gives you great encouragement. Just think about this. Who is Jesus? The text says simply, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. That should encourage us. Here is the eternal God who's manifested himself to us. That's incredible. It affirms the love of God for us. Do you understand what it took for Jesus to do what he did? Do you see the love that motivated that act of revelation? I mean, he could have sent some angel and said, hey, I got a picture. Let me show you the picture. I got a statue. Let me show you the statue. Then the question is, well, I don't really know. I haven't had, I've been, not been that close. You know, so the messenger has an imperfect or an incomplete message. But in order for God to make himself known to you and to me, Jesus robed himself in flesh and blood. Does that encourage you? I mean, that just screams, I love you. I love you. I want a relationship with you. I will so work in your life to draw you to myself. I love you. I love you. I, mean, I hope you hear that scream of God in your heart, that cry of God, that declaration, that affirmation. That, young men, young women, is true reality. That is a true reality. It affirms God's desire for a relationship with us. It affirms God's plan to rescue us. God did not leave us in our sin and suffering. He robed himself in such a way with flesh and blood so that he would be the rescuer out of this sin-cursed world. Now, when you look at another difficult statement, according to the text, again, he is the firstborn of creation. And again, what are we talking about here? Is Jesus the firstborn son of God? And thus not really eternal? And thus not really God? Was Jesus, does Jesus have a beginning? Did, did, did God sort of beget Jesus? You know, God got it started, and then in some work of miracle, Jesus was created. Is that what it means? Firstborn is a term that expresses a, a special relationship with the Father. It's a term of rank and place and privilege. Arianism, taught by Arius, an elder in Alexandria, maintains that Jesus is a created being. There are people who believe that Jesus was created. The Council of Nicaea, 324, condemned this heresy. The Mormon Church teaches that Jesus is a created being. The Jehovah Witness embraces uh, this kind of theology as well. We reject it. We reject it. We don't believe that. Because we see scriptures like this. John 1, verses 1 to 5. He existed before anything was created. John 8, 58 and 59, quoting Exodus 3, 14. He existed before Abraham. Colossians 1, the text that we're going to be looking at here in just a second. He created what exists. John 17, verse 5. He and the Father share the same glory as the eternal persons and not as one derived from the other. And then Hebrews 1, verses 2 to 3. He is exactly like the Father in nature and being. This is Jesus. He is great. He is Lord. He is King of Kings. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the one who loves you and has rescued you out of the debt of your sin. So what does the statement affirm? As I said, first form is a term that, that expresses a special relationship with the Father. It's a term of rank and place and privilege. It's a term, for example, when you look at Psalm 89, verse 27, when speaking of David, I will make him my firstborn. So you see how the parallelism works in the psalm? Firstborn, 
pairs off with or balances out with highest. I will make him my firstborn. God's saying that of David. I'll make him my firstborn. The highest kings or kings of the earth. The Davidic successors. Do you see how that plays out there? To emphasize rank and place and position and priority. You see, in the Colossians context, firstborn comes after a statement of his nature and before a statement of his work. The image of the invisible God, a statement of his work. By him all things were created. He's the firstborn of creation who has a divine plan and privileged relationship to creation. He is the first, the greatest one in creation. He's the one who brought it all into existence. He's not part of it. He was not derived from God. He's the eternal Son of God who brought it all into existence. As you see in 116, Jesus Christ is God. He is the creator of everything. The world in which we live is not the result of chance molecular alignment or random connections. The scriptures affirm the divine cause of all that exists. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 3, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has not come into being. How about 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. And then Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Here's again, these scriptures affirm and inform your worldview about the creation in which we live. Who are we and how do we get here? These texts of scripture, mark them down, they inf inform your worldview about reality and how it all happened and who brought it into existence. Now take a look at the scope of Christ's creative work, the structures of, of creation here in 116, when he talks about all things, both in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, thrones and dominions or rulers and authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. In other words, Christ is preeminently superior over whatever the false teachers want to throw out on the table. Any so-called rival, Jesus is superior. Any so-called better or greater person, Jesus is Lord over all. Now take a look at the, the prepositions of Colossians 1. You know those words that define relationships? They're key in this passage. By him, all things were created. In other words, creation came under the influence and the responsibility of Christ. Jesus brought it about. The plan of creation was by him. It was through him all things have been created. He's the effective agent of creation. And then for him, he's the goal of creation. And the one to be glorified for everything and everything in it. When you look at 117, Jesus Christ is God. He is the preeminent composer of all things. I chose that word specifically because here you see in 117 is before all things and in him all things hold together. Not only does he create it, but he holds it together. And the word has a, a little bit of a nuance of fitting all of the parts together. It's kind of like a composer who puzzles all the different pieces together of the musical composition. Think of Jesus as the composer who's puzzled the creation together just as he willed and desires. He put it into existence, and he put it together, and he's holding it together just as he wants. Then you see in 118 that Jesus Christ is God, the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. Again, verses 18 to 20 open the second stanza of this Christ-centered hymn, and the emphasis now moves from creation to redemption and reconciliation, shedding of the blood, and then the blood of, and I want you to see that there, the blood of his cross, a very personal statement. The stanza also draws our attention to the result of Christ's redemptive work. A new body, the church has been created. Again, it's asserting and giving reasons. And, and I want you to see 
how critical it is in verse 17 and 18 where the church is brought into play. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. All our thoughts about the church must begin with thoughts about Jesus. All our thoughts about the church must begin with thoughts about Jesus. I hope that gives you a fresh perspective on your church and the critical place of it in your life and the, the valued nature of it. This is the body of Jesus Christ, and Christ is the head of it. The church is properly understood as the body of Christ that he heads. Those of you who placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're part of his, his body, over which Christ is the head. He's the head. You're a member of his body. Take a bite and just chew on that. And let that soak deeply into your soul and into your spirit. The individual members of the body are sinners, saved by Jesus, the head of the body. Why? Because he purchased it. The church of God was purchased with the blood of Jesus. Why? Because he shepherds it. The church is a flock cared for by Christ, the chief shepherd. The church is his body, a body of believers. You know, don't ever lose sight of that because the church is more than just a mere organization. Yes, it is an organization organized with leaders and mission and purpose, no doubt. But it's not a dead bureaucracy. It is a living entity with relational qualities. It's an interdependent anatomy growing and moving toward maturity. The church is composed of diverse parts, gifted and outfitted by Christ, a holy priesthood, worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. Jesus Christ is God. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And again, like firstborn in 115, we can understand this in terms of time or position. Jesus does hold a place of prominence and preeminence in creation, and likewise holds a place of prominence and preeminence and superiority in the new creation, in redemption. Jesus is the beginning, leading the way into a new life, a new created order of redemption. He's the first one resurrected. He's the first fruit of the resurrection. Yes, there were resuscitations to life before Christ rose from the grave. You know, remember Jairus' daughter or, or the widow's son or Lazarus. But unlike Jesus, they all died again. Jesus is the first and preeminent one, raised from death to life. His death, his burial, his resurrection give you, give me hope for life after death. That's a reality. We're trying, you know, this text so beautifully constructs a worldview for us of who Jesus is and what this world's all about and who's first in this world in this created order and what life is about and what life after death is all about and as you look at 18c jesus is the beginning of the resurrection so that he'll have first place in everything creation and redemption depend on the supremacy and the preeminence of the lord jesus christ the supremacy of christ over all things is based on his character and his work in 120. He is the beginning of the resurrection because of who he is. All fullness, as you see there, dwells in him. All the fullness of deity, in other words. If you look at chapter 2, verse 9, what does that mean when it says all fullness dwells in him? Well, chapter 2, verse 9 defines it a little bit more precisely. All the fullness of deity dwells in the body of the incarnate, dwells in the incarnate Christ. So both scriptures, 119 and 2, 9, in their context, indicate that the full measure of deity is the character and the person of Jesus Christ. The God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is fully God. If Jesus is fully God, how is he able to do what he did? And how is he able to give? He gives grace. Out of his fullness, we receive grace. Out of that grace and that fullness, we receive reconciliation. As you look at 120, 
And you see there, Jesus is the beginning of the resurrection because of what he did. He reconciled all things to himself. He made peace through the blood of the cross. The hostility that existed between us and God was removed by the brutal death of crucifixion. Peace came. Peace to you and to me. Peace came by blood atonement. Peace came by a substitutionary sacrifice. Peace came by the blood of his cross. Jesus is the greatest eternal person in creation and redemption. His reconciling work affected, effected all things on earth and in heaven. So let me ask you this. Who is first in your life? Who is first in your life? These scriptures affirm a worldview and a true reality for us of who we are, how this world came into existence, what it's all about, how the hostility was removed, why it was done. And so we need to ask the question, who is first in your life? Who's first? Are you first? Are you first in line? Or is Jesus first? You know, as I was praying and walking and just trying to chew on this text, the thought came to my mind simply this. And I was challenged with this thought. Can I say, or can I say, Jesus is Lord? Let me just, just look at me just for a moment. Can you say that? Can you say, Jesus is Lord? This text hopefully encourages you to say that with joy and confidence. Now, maybe some of you are you're asking that question honestly of yourself at the moment. And, you know, can you say Jesus is Lord without feeling some funny twitch in your stomach? Can you say that Jesus is Lord without, in a sense, choking on those words? Can you say Jesus is Lord with great joy and delight and satisfaction? I pray you can. I pray you will. I pray if you feel uncomfortable in your stomach or as those words pass down your throat and you say, man, I, I'm choking on this. I hope you'll take some time to ask yourself why. And you'll ask yourself, who is first in my life? Jesus is Lord. Father, we thank you so much for this text of scripture. We pray that you would encourage us with it. Help us, Father, to confess with great joy and delight and satisfaction that you indeed are Lord over all and in all. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ryan has an announcement before we leave. Just before you leave today, just we're going to give a series of announcements over the next two or three days about the missions conference next week because there's a few events taking place before the actual conference begins as a kickoff next Monday night at 6.30 in Steel 111. We have two individuals coming, uh, Pastor Joseph Germain from um, the Global Refuge Community Church in Tampa. And uh, he is a Clearwater grad from the Eastern uh, Caribbean, and we're so glad that he's going to come and give his life story of how God caused him and led him to reach ethnic groups and diverse groups in this area. And also we have David Lane, one of the chaplains over at USF, who's going to be here at the same time. So the theme of the night is reaching the culture in my city.